here, which means we've done a fantastic job. Today we're finally going to make our own watercolor paint. So we've looked at the slab, the pigments, the binder, every tool that we need or could use for making our own watercolor paint. No more talk from me here. Let's get started on the slab and let's make paint together. So I have all the tools that we need for making our own watercolor. A palette knife, a measuring spoon, an empty pen or more, your muller, a binder and the pigment. So one very important thing is ratios. How much binder are you going to use in combination with pigment? This is different for everyone since I gave you a binder recipe, like something to hold on to, but it doesn't mean you will have the exact same binder as I have. Your binder may be pre-bought, pre-made in a bottle, and I don't know the exact ratios of gum arabic, water, uh, any kind of uh, humectant. I don't know that about other brands, about other makers, about your version. So we're going to kind of have a look how we're going to figure this out together. And we're first going to start with a very basic stuff, which is good for most pigments, at least to start with. We're going to use a one-on-one -on -one ratio. So I have one measuring spoon. In my case, this is a, a teaspoon. And one part of binder. So what we're going to look for here is how wet the pigment uh, gets with the binder. If, it, if it's too sticky, if it's too dry, you may need to add a little bit more binder, but if you use less water in your binder, you can just uh, add water to this mixture as well. It really depends on the ratios you've used in your binder. So, this is Ultramarine Blue, PB29. One of the pigments I said would be a very good start in my last video because they're quite easy to work with. So what I'm doing now is I'm wetting the pigment, meaning I just make sure that it gets in contact with the binder. So there's no more puddle of binder and no more little mountain of dry pigment left on my slab. So if you don't have a muller, you could use an improvised version like a glass that I showed you, but if you work this long enough with a big pellet knife, you can get pretty close. It's not the best way, obviously, but in this ca uh, case, with this pigment, it actually works pretty well. But we want to make the best possible paint that you can make yourself. So we want to disperse it as good as possible with a binder, uh, with with a muller, I'm sorry. So you now have a wetted pigment. It looks, well, it looks like paint. And you might notice a smell, a smell of sulfur. This is very common with ultramarine blue. So the smell of sulfur, it's just part of the chemical composition of ultramarine. And some find it a little bit smelly, some find it a little bit too much for their taste. Um, if you're wearing a proper mask, which I'm not doing right now, also I'm not with my head right above the pigment here, um, but I want to talk at the same time as I make pen. Um, if you're wearing a proper mask, like the one I have over here, with the uh, heavy duty filters on it, you won't be able to notice the smell of any pigment. So some pigments are more smelly than others. Some are actually just without any odor. So mulling for me 
is something that I just patiently start with. I don't want to rush this, but to be honest, I don't want to do this any longer than necessary as well. So how do you know the proportions of binder and pigment, the ratio? How do you know that's right? Well, we're going to do a little, a little finger swipe test later when we swatch it. Basically, if you have a swatch of a color and it just wipes off the paper when you go over it with your finger when it's dry, so please don't do it when it's wet, it obviously comes off, but when it's dry and the pigment just, just rubs off the paper, it means you need more binder, more of that beautiful glue that we made to make it stick to the paper. It could be the, the other way around. You use too much binder. Then you get kind of the bronzed, glossy edges around a watercolor swatch. If it doesn't have that those bronze edges a lot for some watercolors or for some pigments but for some watercolor brands also um, it's almost a thing that they all have for some pigments give it that little shiny edge a lot quicker than others when you use it in mass tones or when you use loads of pigment uh, on the paper but for other pigments that just don't do that you, know, you, you, you can barely see it If it does have that and you know with every pigment that you work with oh my apologies it means you used too much binder um, please don't let yourself be fooled by any of those you know beautiful pillow topped pans of handmade watercolors uh, that have a f completely matte finish like on the top it looks like a a, a, a candy a sweet uh, something maybe made out of chocolate, something very delicate, um, and it's completely mutt, and it looks beautiful, and, you know, if you can get it that way, and the proportions of pigment and binder are all right, uh, you've nailed it, but not every pigment looks like that when it's dry. So I just want to, you to keep that in mind, when you have, like, a glossy paint, which is already dry, but it's glossy, some pigments just end up more glossy than others. So I'm just patiently doing this and I can use more surface, but when I do that, it's get a, it, it would get a little bit too dry. So what I'm doing now, I'm starting to build up my downwards pressure so literally my hand that goes down towards the plate so m a lot of pressure between that uh, the, the, the bottom of my muller my slab and the pigment in between I want to get a lot of pressure to get that dispersion going a lot more efficient In some other videos, I've used the Hackman gauge, the grindometer, or well, there's more names for it, but it's the Hackman gauge, and um, it's a tool to see if your paint is dispersed well enough. Well, you can do it with this little, just quick little trick. You can use the side of your palette knife and just swipe along just somewhere in the middle, somewhere where it's evenly spread it in your paint. And you can see a beautiful transition from, I'm just going through it, from the master, like fully opaque layer of paint over, sorry about that, over there, towards this one, which is just, you know, my glass surface stained with a little bit of pigment. But this part in between here shows a little, just a graduate uh, piece of going from that opaqueness of the layer of paint towards that very thin layer where, where it just gets transparent. This is a neat little trick if you don't have a, ha a Hackman gauge 
you actually don't need one it's just a tool to um, to, make, to make your measurements more precise but you can eyeball it like this if there's any visible pigment particles within that line you need a little bit more mulling if your paint gets too dry too sticky with an easy pigment like ultramarine blue you think okay I need to mull it a lot since um, I don't know mine is just it has some grains in it like like lump together pieces of pigment and it makes that sticky sound and it makes it really hard to have control over your muller this is always filled with distilled water here and I'll refresh it uh, almost every day it, it has <laughs> Uh, I, I try to wash it as well, but it just gets some pigment stains uh, on it when, you know, sometimes it just falls over. All my hands are dirty and it, it gets here, but nothing wrong with just adding a little bit of water to help you. As you can see, it's sticky here, but as soon as I touch that water, you can see the layer between the muller and the glass gets thinner. I gain my control over my muller. The paint doesn't have any control over me right now, so it's not that sticky anymore. There's no resistance with the paint going on. I can easily control it and I can just easily mull along. This was a teaspoon of pigment and I'm pretty sure that, you know, we can do it like, maybe clean it first. That's the way. I'm pretty sure this is a finished paint. It's that easy. It's that quick sometimes. Some pigments take an hour for a, for a quantity like this. Uh, some people mull for hours. And I've, uh, I'm, ju I'm just talking about a quantity like a teaspoon or maybe two teaspoons, but I've never milled for multiple hours. And I noticed that I almost was mulling for a very long time. Um, when I use my muller in relax mode, so you know, just putting my hand slightly. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using any downforce here, but just using my hand, and I'm making like those eight shapes or little circular motions all towards the middle, which is another kind of trick to get maybe some dry pigment particles all gather within the middle and then you just go do that sideways up and down whatever works for you but this movement is not the only thing that makes mulling mulling it literally doesn't do anything more than going with your pellet knife over your slab or over, or over any smooth surface this may be even more efficient as you can see it, it it forms thinner layers which means that binder and the pigment particles get intertwined and get dispersed more efficient more easy faster I don't know but this would work better than if you only use a muller like this so it eventually would work, but you need a longer time. So I was trying this out and I noticed when I use a lot of pressure and when I really use, use a lot of pressure and I make small motions, you can see I get that same transparency here. So I can see almost see the glass surface through those little circular motions a lot more. I'm just going to do it here again. A lot more than I would do this hopefully it's visible for you but this just takes longer so like I said downwards pressure on the slab with your muller a little bit of elbow grease just a little workout gets the job done way quicker
So a beautiful Muller stamp here, but this is precious paint. Well, this is not the most expensive pigment at all. One of the most cheap pigments actually. But still, the paint that we made is precious. So we want to get as much as possible of that slab. So as you can see, what I'm doing here, I'm, well, I'm holding it quite steadily, but I'm using this finger to actually make it, like the pressure towards the plate. I make that blade completely aligned with the plate. So as much paint as possible comes off. This part, when you're cleaning the plate, that scraping creates a little friction with the glass and, and your metal surface over here. That friction creates a little heat and that heat makes it smell more like silver. In the beginning you smelt it when you were mulling, it was kind of there, but this part like that heat, that friction, makes that smell come up just a little bit more. So this is my tiny amount of ultramarine blue. I have one of my brand pens here that says PB29 and Dirty Blue on the side. Since we're making ultramarine blue, which is pigment number PB29, we're filling it, but as you can see, only a tiny layer, maybe a third of the pan. I don't want to have any air bubbles in it, so I might just tap it. I'm coming back in an hour to pop like any bubbles that came to the surface. You can do that with the tip of your brush or with a needle, uh, whatever works for you. Uh, I wouldn't use like a pencil or anything because that might just leave traces of graphite or, or pigments when you have color pencils. Uh, but just a needle or a screwdriver, a very fine palette knife, uh, a pipette, anything might work to get those bubbles out. Uh, but to start it with it, just tapping it so all the surface bubbles just pop because of that tap. If you have a vacuum machine, be careful with it. You can use it. I wouldn't use it when it's in a pan. Right, so this little pile over here has some bubbles in it. So when I pull this into a pan, I take that, those bubbles and pour them with the paint in the pan. If you make a larger amount of paint or this and scoop this in a little jar or a glass or a bottle first, put that in a vacuum machine, all the bubbles will come out, but it will expand first. Right? If you have a vacuum machine, you know how it works. Uh, maybe for epoxy or silicone or, or whatever. Um, if you do this in a pan and there's loads of bubbles and it expands, your pan might flow over and your vacuum machine is covered in paint. It's, you know, more work to clean and it's a shame of, you know, the hard work you just put in a lovely handmade watercolor. So this was ultramarine blue. And I'm just going to show you the entire process that I usually use for my paints. So this is the, this is the Hagman gauge that I was talking about. I'm going to drop my paint over here. I'm just swiping that all the way along the line. And it's beautiful. It's, it's a part of it almost goes to a little bit, a little bit above zero uh, micrometers, which is a very fine dispersed paint. This is a really, really fine dispersed paint. It's a really fine pigment as well. So uh, when it's dispersed fully, that is the result you can expect. Also, we're going to swatch it, you know, just to show you the entire process. I'm going to take a little uh, cheaper swatching paper here since we are uh, well, we're experimenting, right? This was your first time making paint and uh, you don't know what to look for. You don't want to use your best watercolor paper. If you have enough of it, please go ahead and use the most expensive stuff. You get the best result and the best look um, uh, for what it is. But just for the test, if it 
just you know wipes off. Um, we are going to use a piece of uh, watercolor paper that's not too expensive. We're just going to use all this distilled water here on our slab. And like I said, this is for the experiment. So from this point on, when you're working with a new pigment, please don't fill up all your pans before you try this, right? So please don't uh, pour all the paint that you have into pans, let it dry and swatch then. Um, I'm going to let this dry and I'm going to come back later to see if it wipes off. If it didn't, well, uh, my ratios here worked for this pigment with my binder. If it just wipes off the paper with, you know, the, the, the finger test, um, it, it means that you need a little bit more binder. So the paint that I have over here um, need to be remilled with a little bit more binder in it. So I'm going to let this dry. I'll be right back and let's see what we made. Right, it's been a few minutes and um, you might see a little bit of difference, but it's dry. So I'm going to swipe just a finger or a thumb, a finger across the paint towards an empty piece, a uh, clean piece of paper. So if I'm going to do this, rub it a little bit harder, nothing happens, right? So there's no blue smear of pigment on the paper here, which means we've done a fantastic job, right? So the paint that I have over here, it might be a little bit more sticky than yeah, it was because in the meantime, that dried as well. If you want to do this um, and you are very new to making paint, uh, don't make too much paint when trying out working with a new pigment. Just um, uh, what would be better is a an, an eighth of a teaspoon, maybe. Um, to you know a one-on-one -on -one ratio uh, the, the binder the pigment uh, so you have just a little bit of paint that you can experiment with this is enough to fill two three pens fully so without you know uh, thinking about the layers for now I'm just going to take some more empty pens that I printed I'm going to just pour that in well, in this phase, in this step of making paint, obviously the part of making paint itself, I'm trying to work as neatly as possible. But for this, the cleaner you work, the less you have to clean up from the pan. Oh, this was a wrong one, sorry. Sorry, my pan's over here. The less you have to clean up from the sides of the pan or whatever. If you want to make them look you know, nice and clean, if you want to sell them later, um, I would advise just pouring it slowly. Some people prefer using spoons. Uh, some people make a really large batch and store that in a jar uh, so they, they can pour like the little layers without having to make uh, a new batch of paint for every layer. Um, it really depends on the paint for me. Some paint is just a lot of work. A hydrophobic pigment, for instance, is a lot of work. And uh, it's a lot different than the paint I just made. So when we think about, you know, blue paint, a famous example of a hydrophobic pigment would be phthalo blue. It's hydrophobic, it's staining, it's non-granulating, it's everything this pigment isn't, right? So this pigment is everything um, a, a phthalo a PB15 pigment isn't. So this one is beautifully lifting when you're working with a clean wet brush, you can lift the, the pigment just you know, when you re-wet it on the paper, you can lift it off. Um, this is a granulating pigment. Um, uh, this is a not hydrophobic. This almost just dissolves into the water. And it's a beautiful blue to start with. 
As a quick comparison, I'm now going to show you what a Taylor Blue looks like. But first, let me clean my play. Okay, just to show you a Taylor Blue, it is PB15-3 from Crema Pigmenter. And I'm just going to show you what the same ratio of binder and pigment in eighth of a teaspoon looks like. So this is a hydrophobic pigment and just notice the difference with how this pigment reacts on the binder. If I look at it like this, it looks like it's still all dry, but my binder is just here underneath the pigment. It's not flowing through it. It's not uh, almost dissolving. I have a ball of binder here with pigment around it. Now slowly the pigment falls off. And my trick, which I'm going to share with you for hydrophobic pigments, is actually, you know, take that binder, or as much as possible, spread that binder around the pigment, and slowly work it in. Well, just to show you what it looks like if I use the same method that I just used you can see I'm just throwing around with a lot of dry pigment. Obviously you can also clearly see why ultramarine blue and phthalo blue are used next to each other in a, in a palette. This is just such a totally different blue than ultramarine is. This is phthalo blue green shade. You also have a Taylor Blue Red shade, which is still very, very different from Ultramarine Blue. Not only in the hue of blue, but like I said, the characteristics of it. It's hydrophobic, it stains, it's... Uh, I'm going to use my small molar for it, by the way. It's non-lifting, or at least the liftability of the pigment from the paper, the paint, is quite hard it stains a lot in this case it's drying quite fast as well so I've used just a small amount of binder and a phthalo pigment like this with you know coronacridones as well by the way um, can use a little bit more binder than just that one-on-one -on -one ratio that we used before. Right now, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm feeling a little bit resistance over the glass, but I'm not feeling like I'm doing anything with, uh, uh, in any form of dispersing. So, the change of color when water is added. There you go. Right, water will evaporate. Don't use too much water when you're working with heavy pigments because the pigment particles would just. Uh, sink down when you pour it in the pan or you need to pour the tiniest layers as possible but water will eventually evaporate so it wouldn't have any influence on the quality of your paint as long as you don't use too much when your paint gets too fluid 
Um, the dispersion might, you know, kind of lose all of its beautiful, like, pigment particles spread out evenly throughout the uh, binder. We wouldn't want that. So, for the viewers that come here more often, have seen more of my videos all lives where I have the same perspective uh, most of the time, uh, you might have seen something different here. I have a black rectangle underneath my slab, underneath the rubber. It's actually a small, a very thin heating mat that's used for epoxies. And why did I add that? Some pigments require more fluid, more water, not more binder, but more water, um, to comfortably mold the paint for a longer time. And sometimes you need to add just a little bit of water throughout the end. And you know, when you find out the paint is good, it's still wet, I can just turn them on, on my heating mat in the middle, make my paint like spread it out a little bit evenly throughout the middle and the water just ev slowly evaporates. The paint dries a little bit, just a little bit on my slab. And when it gets like tacky enough, when it's uh, the consistency that I want to pour it into my pans, I can just scrape it all to the side where I have all the time, well, not all the time, but where I have a lot of time to work with it. So this is, well, it's drying again, but for a tiny amount of phthalo, this really is enough to show you the difference apart from whatever you see on the slab over here. So I'm going to take my water again and I'm going to just This is such a tinting pigment as well, meaning when you want to dilute it with water, the saturation, the amount of pigment, the, the amount of color stays more intense. So this is what pig, uh, that, that's, that's what tinting means. Uh, when you would mix this with white, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, this would be more blue than a less tinting pigment. So I'm just going to uh, make a quick swatch next to the ultramarine blue for you. Just to see, just to show you what a little swatch of beautiful transparent, non-granulating, and the little specks that you see here is the structure of the paper. And staining and hydrophobic sailor blue looks like next to ultramarine. Right, so this is working with a hydrophobic pigment. What I prefer to do with hydrophobic pigments is work in small batches. Uh, not only because hydrophobic pigments take just longer to wet, as you have seen. My apologies for that noise. But also you saw that, especially in the beginning, the dry pigment was just moved around. And with Taylor pigments, Dry pigments are so fine, they can just easily uh, rise up in the air, especially, you know, I'm talking, I'm, I still have a little bit of diff distance, enough distance here uh, from my face towards the slab, but um, I wouldn't make any large badge here just for my, my own health and safety uh, without wearing a mask. And in particular, just not any large batch of this pigment because of that little pigment particles fly around because it's not only the breathing in part, but it's if it's in the air, in your atmosphere, in the room where you're working, you don't want it to be your bedroom when, when you know, the entire f air is filled with phthalo particles. Uh, it might not be on the list of harmful or toxic pigments, but there have been some researchers that, um, well, it's not good for you. 
So even if it's not a toxic pigment you're working with, always health and safety first. Right, so as you see, I got a little bit of blue and that's just from the powder that is probably, let's have a look with a clean finger. It's probably blue from the side over here. It's not even paint, not too much. Um, but this is just enough for a little dot pen of my own design. Um, showing you this again, this is not dry. I can show you uh, if this wipes off the paper with the uh, same test after, as I've done this before, um, when it's dry. In the meantime, I'm going to clean up again. So ideally, when they're drying, put them in a place where there's not too, too much dust or no dust at all. If you have animals uh, and, you, and you just lay them on your desk or within little wire racks, please don't let your cats crawl over them because uh, <laughs> dust and hair uh, might get trapped into the paint and especially when the first layer is or any layer is drying and there's dust or hair in it it's almost impossible to get out you need to re-wet it with water to just use a brush and get everything out it's just a waste of time which you can use to make other colors or make more layers right so think about all those aspects uh, when you're making it for yourself and think okay I'm not going to let it dry uh, in a pan I want to put it in a tube you can buy empty tubes just scoop it in, uh, ideally, if you like that consistency better, uh, let the paint dry a bit on your slab, so spread it out uh, so the water can evaporate it, so you can scoop it and kind of drizzle it with the syrupy consistency into a tube, just a little bit easier. Um, also, it, it comes out of the tube more easy, plus when you want to store it for a longer time in a tube, uh, make sure you get that syrupy consistency. So you might want to cover your slab for a while with uh, a tray or something to keep the dust from, from getting into your paint. Because when you want to store it for a longer time, or you need to ship it somewhere um, in a tube, and it still has a watery consistency, it might just shift and you know separate the binder and the pigment particles or just uh, the, the pigment particles might settle uh, all, all the way on the bottom of a tube when it, it lays flat you don't want that so all those things are aspects you need to think about um, before you start even pouring it into something right so I have the uh, Ftalo blue PB153 next to PB29 and uh, well I, I can show you this this is the reason why I have them next to each other in my mixing palette we have a lovely uh, structural granulating blue, a warm blue, um, which gives that nice, nice touch of granulation. It gives that effect. And we have a staining. As you can see, it doesn't wipe off. So we did, we did good again. Um, Phthalo blue, which leans to the, uh, well, to the green side of the blues, uh, to the other side of the spectrum. And these are beautiful to mix with you know, yellows, reds you get different hues of violets uh, uh, greens neutrals whatever you want to make with it right so if you have something similar like this uh, let me know down in the comments what you thought of this class what you thought uh, about your first experience or maybe uh, the experience while making paint with me uh, uh, tell me all about it in the comments Please share the video if you liked it. L give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you don't already, please follow my channel. I need to say all these things because I want to, to spread this as much as possible. I want everyone to enjoy the art of paint making. But I want to share this with as much people as possible. Um, I had a question about another binder. If you know who you are, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I talked about that in a previous video about the paint making. Uh, that comes up in the future. I'm working on a series about pigments, pigment families, um, uh, the quality of different pigments, loads of stuff coming up about the subject. I'm back again for those of you who have waited for this video for a long time. Uh, for those of you who just started following me or started following these classes on how to make your own watercolors. 
uh, luckily you didn't have to wait for this last video. I'm going to show you how I make watercolors with all the pigments that I work with. So those aren't classes, but those are just step-by-step -step videos on how I work, my process, my findings, and a little bit of background story about the pigments that I work with. So if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, uh, any feedback, just leave it down in the comments. Um, hopefully, see you very soon. I'll make sure that my content will be uploaded more often with more exciting things coming up. And I hope to see you back with one of those videos as soon as I post them, maybe a bit later, but please don't miss out on it. If you don't want to miss anything and you already follow my channel, just turn on notifications so you're the first one to know when I upload a new video. And like I said, any feedback, if you missed anything, just leave it down in the comments so I can add that to a new video. I can make, maybe make a separate video about it. Uh, I'm open for everything because we're doing this together. I'm doing this for you and we're building a little paint making community uh, full of pigment nerds color enthusiasts and I'm already really really thankful of where we are right now. So try to spread the word even more and see you next time.